All right. Once again, I want to go to our Lord and Savior. And I want to ask Him to do what only He can do. Heavenly Father, I pray in Jesus' name that You would prepare our hearts to receive what You would have for us. Help us to understand that this is not a lecture by flesh and blood. This is the deliverance of sacred text of the very Word of God. And because of that, and the working of your Holy Spirit, we can see beyond not only these walls, but we can see beyond time. And we can catch a glimpse of what it is that we are entrusted to be and to do. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to grasp that. Once again, we come and we rejoice that we can come in the Savior's name who shed His blood and paid an unbelievable price for so great salvation. In His name again we come. Amen. If your Bible is like mine, when you come to Revelation 21, you can see the last part of Revelation 20. I know that there are a lot of places in my Bible that have some real, I don't want to call it drama, but human intrigue. In other words, what is written there truly, truly impacts humanity. Now, maybe because of our culture, we have been kind of dulled to this. Maybe because we have wound up seeing, I mean, slaying, actual human slaying on television. We, we've seen over and over again shootings and this and that. It just gets to be mundane, but it ought not to be. I look at my Bible, and just before chapter 21, I see Revelation 20, and I read this. Verse 11, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Please understand, we are talking about people. We're talking about people just like you and I. You see, everybody, everybody, that has ever been born will exist forever. Am I right? Everybody will exist. Now, I, I have a difficult time outside of the working of the Holy Spirit to grasp it, but I just do know this. I want to grasp it. Right after church this morning, I'm back in my office, and Julie's here with her two little children. London, who, if the Lord tarries, I'm sure will take over the world someday, I mean, she's just playing around. That, that kid just absolutely warms my heart. I've got, I've got other grandkids. They're not here anymore. They're down in Tracy. And then others are up in Washington State. And I know you, we've got people here. Your grandkids and great grandkids aren't, aren't around, but I just, I love it when one of mine or two or whatever is around. But there is something that when I'm going through my prayer list, I remember that little girl has an eternal soul. Now, do you have a Bible? Does your Bible speak about salvation? Does everybody need to be saved? Then what we hold, we absolutely cannot fathom outside of the authority of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit of that God. Let's continue. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Praise God, we're not saved by our works. But mankind outside of Christ will be judged by their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. It's interesting to note that that which mankind for millennia has banked on to save them, they will realize someday it is part of their damnation because they're judged by their works. But why are they cast into the lake of fire? This verse says so. Says why? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That absolutely is one of the most sobering verses in God's Word. It stops me. It sends a chill down my spine. And that's why I have it in large print at the very beginning of my Bible. I need to be reminded that that outside of Jesus Christ, mankind is doomed and damned. Now, this is not what I planned on preaching on. I just wanted you to understand that there is the great pivotal point here. Because this is the place where mankind separates forever. Now, having said that, I want to ask you, how many of you love to receive a blessing? Something that happens that's good. You know, somebody does something for you. I praise God for every person in this church that prays for me and my family. I praise God for every person that gives, that gives to missions, that gives to uh, the, 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 the ongoing work of the ministry here. They give as unto the Lord, not to me, but as unto the Lord. I praise God for people who desire to be used of God. I praise God for that. That's a blessing to me. Which brings me to this. I love to receive a blessing. You love to receive a blessing, but let me ask you this. How many of you, now please stop and listen, you want to be a blessing? I mean, I, I, and I've seen so many of you be a blessing. But you, you see, understand, if, if the last part of chapter 20 is true, and the first part to the end of the book of chapter 21 is true, we are in the position to be a blessing because we know how it's going to end. We know what's at the end of the book. There are others that they've read it, they don't believe it, they cast it aside. We know you can't do that. I do want to preach about heaven. Like I mentioned this morning, it was one year ago, this last week, on the 15th, that my sister died. Kind of a tough time for my mom, by the way. It was 11 years ago today, 11 years ago today, that my dad went to be with the Lord. I'm telling you, heaven's getting sweeter all the time. There was a lady that was here. I thought she was going to be here. She still might be able to make it. I don't know. Mary Carlstrom here. When I was a youth pastor, I was going up at times, taking the children in our, in our church, taking them up to Lucerne. Some of you remember going up there to Lucerne. And there was a young boy that was a, that was in, was a junior, uh, fifth or sixth, I think it was either fifth or sixth grade, was up there for junior camp. His name was Jared Carlstrom, Mary's son. I led him to Christ. That was great. A couple of years later, we wound up coming here. And all of a sudden, we saw, here's Mary. In fact, she was doing the books at that time because there was nobody else to do them. She'd work all night and then come here and do the books for the, uh, for the church. And we saw Jared here and said, praise God, this is great. Well, going down the road, Jared got busy doing roller skating. Not, not the... Not, not the stuff, you know, the roller derby, not like that. But it was actually kind of like ice skating, and he competed there. In fact, one time, we were on vacation. We were here, and we were traveling to Minnesota, and we went through Lincoln, Nebraska, and we saw this big competition, and, and the, it sounded familiar, and we thought, I wonder if Jared's there. Jared turned out to be there. Jared got older, and we didn't see a whole lot of, a whole lot of him. One day, 
uh, he was, I knew he was a senior in high school. One day, we came into what's now the war room. And my wife was my secretary at that time. And it was my office. And I went in. The light was blinking. And I just punched the button to see what was going on. And there was a man on the other end of the line was crying. And I thought, what in the world is going on? It was the principal of North Highlands, of Highlands High. Highlands High. And through the sobbing, we found out Jared had dropped dead. He was in P.E., had just run out onto the athletic field with a few of his friends, and all of a sudden, just collapsed. He was dead. It was at that time, we had just finished with our first uh, revival meeting with Chuck Cofty. At that time, Billy Graham had just come to town. And he was having his revival meeting over here at what at that time was Arco Arena. <clears throat> I'll never forget that. Jared literally had hundreds of friends. He had friends in school, friends that he, that he, uh, that he did roller, you know, with the uh, roller skating. We had the biggest crowd for his funeral. We had the biggest crowd that I've ever personally ever had in this auditorium. We had about 600 people here. They lined the walls. They were full. We didn't have this, uh, this room over here at the time. They were in the foyer. They were across here. Hundreds of them came in and I said, look, some of you have been over to Arco Arena. There's a message that you're hearing. I want to tell you what it's all about. And I started giving the plan of salvation. We didn't go, we didn't do much into into Jared's past or what he did and this and that. There was a little bit of that. But I wanted to make sure these people knew the gospel. They heard the gospel. I explained it very carefully, took everybody through, and said, okay, I want your heads bowed. And they bowed their heads. And I brought them through praying, Lord, you know, save, I realize I'm a sitter, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, look, if you just prayed that, and I mean in all honesty, you prayed that, and you have trusted, you have put your personal faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want you to raise your hand. At least 50 hands went up. I praise God for that day. I got to do the same thing again. There was a roller, uh, there was a place, I forget where exactly where it was, where they had a lot of, uh, where was it? Okay. Anyway, there was about 250, 300 that were there. Got to do the very same thing. By the way, one thing that was kind of interesting, kind of sad, really, the news people were there. And as soon as I started giving the gospel, the cameras went off. The gospel is just not that important. They'll find out someday that it is. You see, it's so important to bring people from chapter 20 to chapter 21. There has to be a time, and I got to thinking about this, there's so much that I'm lining up Looking into 2016, folks, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of getting excited. I, I, I see what's going on in the world, and I see this as a critical time. Don't you? I mean, we've heard so many people talk about end time things and this and that, and there's, you know, there's this book written and that book written. I don't know all about that. I just know that it is my God given responsibility to take this local fellowship to the Word of God and say, look, We've got to be prepared. We've got to be prepared. <clears throat> We're, I, look, I am not one that thinks that, you know, the rapture is going to take us out. You know, we'll never suffer. That's The Bible never says anything like that. We will, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom. There is a specific time known as the great tribulation, but there is tribulation. If you're reading, if, if you're looking into the news right now, you will have heard, for instance, about the Christians in Syria, the, the, the boy that was taken and the father that was challenged. Will you renounce Christ? Will you come back to Islam? And as they were t t uh, asking him that, they were chopping his boy's fingers off one at a time, at a time, at a time. And the boy, and the, and the dad never, never said, he, no, ain't gonna do it. The two ladies that were misused and abused and all of them were put on a cross and crucified. Hey, there's that kind of thing going on. I don't know what's going to happen here. I just know this. We are not, we, we are not here 
just to simply prepare ourselves to go through difficult times. No, no, no. This is what we're prepared to do. We want to be a blessing. Are you listening? We want to be a blessing to people. We want to have the people that, like Roger was talking about, Dennis over here, who heard and has has so soaked in the Word of God about people like this last week that we, some of us, have been able to speak to regarding the gospel, to have the leaky seed basket. Because every one of us will come across somebody that doesn't know Jesus Christ this next week. So my question to you is this. Do you want to be a blessing? What kind of a blessing? To bring people from darkness to light. To transition souls from chapter 20 to chapter 21. To not live in a state of me, me, me. But Lord, send me anywhere, only go with me. I want you to see that when it comes to preaching and teaching on heaven, there, there's three things that we need to look at. There's three reasons. First of all, we need to, we need to stop and think what it means for your future. What does heaven mean for your future? Guess what? When we read 21 through the end of the book, we're talking about our future. There comes a time when mankind is divided forever. Those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior, who are bought by the blood of the Lamb, this is where we go. Look at verse 1, chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's us, folks. That is what is coming. Richard Baxter, one of my favorite people to read, said this, My knowledge of that life is small. The eye of faith is dim, but it's enough that Christ knows all. And I shall be with him. There are some things about this earth that I love, but it's going to be gone. There are some things about this existence that I find fascinating. I love my wife. I really do. I wish we could be married in eternity. That's not going to happen. I'm not going to wait and stop and think about what's coming then. I just know this. I love my wife. But I do know this, that my God has for us both, has for all of us, has an existence that is beyond the pale. But it's a real existence. And it ought to be impacting us now. When I think of this existence, quite honestly, there are some things that they discourage me. I see sin. I see despair. I, I mean, when, when I think of the, the, what, the capacity of what humans can do to other humans, I mean, to actually take a boy and be cutting his fingers off one at a time to get something out of the father, that is absolutely horrendous. One of the things I find when I look at this and I rejoice in, It's a place of holiness. There are some things we're leaving behind that I am so glad that we're going to be leaving behind. Look at chapter 21. Just skip ahead to verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Aren't you glad? Stop and think of what we're leaving behind. Now, why is this important? to think about. Glad you asked that. We'll be focusing on that in just a little bit. Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie. When somebody's speaking to you, there is going to be not even a thought, is he telling me the truth? It will be true. But they which are written in the Lamb's book of life, That's who's going to be there. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 that it's a place of unity, that the Lord is gathering together in one. All things in Christ will be there together. I know people put down denominations. We shouldn't even have denominations. Listen, denominations are things that tell people how we interpret Scripture. That's why I'm an independent fundamental Baptist. I'm not putting anybody down. Independent, nobody tells us what to preach. 
Fundamental, we believe in the fundamentals of the faith. Like Brother Whiteside was talking about this morning, there are some things that you need to endure in. Hey, is the Bible the Word of God? You have my permission. If I am never, if, if there comes a time when I'm not here and somebody in this pulpit gets up and says, now you know, the Bible contains the Word of God. You have my permission to get up in mass, carry that guy out of the pulpit to the front and say, you're never coming in here. You don't want to do that. The Bible is the Word of God. Amen? And these things, you know, we need to remember. And again, the reason why it's so important to us is the message that we have. There are more people that hate it now than ever. When I get, when we get into this series, I'm going to be telling you, uh, into the series that I'm going to be doing soon, Burdened Hearts or Blinded Eyes, the people that despise this message, you know why? The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And sometimes the foolish are given a microphone and even a camera and even a network. But they hate it. They hate it. For us, though, there are some things that we hold on to. And that's why, again, local, local church authority, all that, that, that's why I'm a Baptist. I don't look at somebody else and put them down or something like that. Praise God, they can have their convictions. But I know whom I have believed, and I know how we take this word. The Bible interprets itself. Let's get into it. It's a place of unity. By the way, it's a place of joy. Somebody said one time, you know there's going to be no humor in heaven. You know that's true? Because in order to have certain kind of humor, laughter, you have to have pain. There is no pain in heaven. But there is fullness of joy. People stop and think, they say, well, what are we going to do in heaven? It's going to be morning. boring. No, no, no. Well, yeah, but what are we going to do? See, people have this kind of an idea. They wake up in the morning, okay, I need to eat. I need to do something. Hey, I'm bored. I need to do something. There is no need in heaven. People will not eat because they're starving. They'll eat because they're joyful. They're not, there's not going to be that hunger. Physical, emotional, nothing like that. That's what my Bible says. It's a place for all eternity because when the Lord was trying to describe this to Nicodemus in John 3.15, he said that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. There's a, dist- there's a difference between existence and life. I want life. So do you, right? Amen? This is what we're talking about, folks. This is what we're talking about. Get into it. I love Psalm 23. I know many of you do as well. And David, when he wrote it, said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We're in Israel. Supposedly, what we're looking at is the tomb of David. It sits in a building, and it's covered up with a flag. It's a blue flag, and on that flag are different emblems, different pictures of what David was involved in when he was here on earth. The fact of the matter is, I don't know if that was actually David's body that was in there, and there's a few others that question it. But I do know this, I know where David is. And he's with his Lord forever. There's going to be no temple. Look at chapter chapter 21, look at verse 22. Check this out. And I saw no temple there. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. There's going to be no more coming to church. Because we are the church. And He's there. Now, this is where our knees begin to buckle a little bit. Because the fact of the matter is, this takes the eye of faith. That's okay. But understand this. We can take this and dwell on it 
And there begins to be somewhat of a picture of where we're headed. By the way, please also understand this. When we talk about heaven, we're talking about a place that is as real as this place. People say, well, now wait a minute. You know, the Bible says God is a spirit. That's right. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And then he goes on to describe, and also here in the Revelation, actual trees, a river flowing. These are not spiritual rivers with spiritual trees. This is real. Just because God is spirit doesn't mean that heaven is spirit. There is a real city, New Jerusalem, that will come and settle on a new heaven and a new earth. It's reality. So by the way, I want to remind you of something. Do you want to be a blessing? You personally take the time to grasp what the Word of God is saying here because it impacts your future and the future of anybody that you give the gospel to. You be a blessing by telling them, hey, I know that you can know if you died right now, you could go where I'm going. You can go to heaven. That's what it's all about. Look at chapter 21 again and go back to verse 4. Look at this. There's so much that we're going to be leaving behind. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. How do we know this? Because he says this, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. You go into this chapter further, and we've kind of skipped around it a little bit, but you realize that there's no more sin. Nothing like that. Verse 27, again, anything that violeth. There's no more judgment on sin. Revelation 22, verse 3, there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Oh, that's it. Heaven's going to be about slavery. Are you kidding me? To be with the God that so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son? I love that thought. There's going to be no night. Look at chapter 22, verse 5. There shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. According to Revelation 4, 2, the Father, God the Father, will be there. According to Revelation 5, 6, the Son will be there. According to Revelation 14, 13, and 22, 17, the Spirit will be there. In fact, the Spirit joins the bride, the church, and gives this message across the years. Come. It's interesting that one of the last things that's said that speaks about us personally, we wind up looking back through time in Revelation 22 and saying this. Look at verse, if you want to, look at verse 17, Revelation 22. And the Spirit and the bride say, come. It's an invitation. And let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. This place right now is being prepared for us according to Christ in John 14. That's why we think of it. There's the reason, because it impacts our future. I miss my sister. It's been tough on my mom. But I'll never forget, just a few weeks before she died, it was just me and her in her bedroom. And I said, Randy, I've got to ask you a question that I have never asked anybody before, especially in this situation. What's it like? She knew she was going to be dead within a few weeks. I said, Randy, what's it like? She said, it's fine. Now understand something. 
My sister did not have a good life in many, in, in some respects. There was some real difficulty, and because we're coming over the internet, I'm not going to say anything more beyond that. But I do know this. I looked my sister in the eye, and her heart was joyful in the Lord. She says, I've had a good life. She says, the thing that really, that really gets to me right now is that I didn't do more for him. Boy, you talk about a slap in the face to a brother that's a pastor. My sister's preaching a message that everybody ought to hear, including me. This is what it means for our future. So what does it mean for our present then? When we think about heaven, what does it mean? It means this. Heaven is worth living for. Heaven is worth living for. If we can bring, if we can transition people by the grace of God from chapter 20 to chapter 21, if they can escape verse 15, Revelation 20, 15, if because of the gospel of Christ, they can escape that and they can join us here. Hey, listen, thinking about heaven is great. People have said, no, no, don't, don't be. So heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. I contend that if you're heavenly minded, minded, you're earthly excellent. Because you're recognizing this is what, this is what we're here for. I'm not here anymore to do the nine, nine to five routine. I'm here because I know him. And this is going to disappear. Our life is but a vapor. It's gone. It's gone. I was looking at this, you know, the other day, and I thought, man, I've gotten used to this. I've been carrying it around all my life, but one of these days, it's done. That's a good thing, because it's really changing. I look in the mirror, and it scares me to death. Now, don't you laugh, because you're doing the same thing. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you get your high school picture out and see what I mean. <laughs> This is why we're told by Christ in Matthew 6. Go back to Matthew 6, if you would please. You know, it's, I've, it's been so long, it's been so long since I've really preached on the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm telling you, I'm, 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 I'm wanting to get back there because there are some things I get to thinking about when we saw there. Church, you don't know what you did for my wife and I when you sent us to Israel. I mean, just the other day, we're, you know, we're, we're sitting in our chair side by side, we're reading our Bibles, and, uh, and I went, I'm in Capernaum. I just, it's, it's great, you know, because we can envision it. And I can see where Christ preached this message. By the way, we really are going to do this. I'm thinking, I've got to do it. There's enough people in the church. I want to show the pictures. I said, I, I said slides, and somebody said, nobody does slides anymore. You're right. I want to get the PowerPoint out. I want to show the, the church the pictures that we took in Israel again, because we get to looking at them every once in a while, and it's like, oh man, this is, this is just great. But look at verse 19. Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now listen to this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What is some of that that we can have as treasure in heaven? Hey, how about crowns that we can lay at his feet? How about crowns that we can lay at his feet? This is why preaching on heaven impacts our present. Because by faithfulness, and by the way, he gives us the power to do it, we wind up having opportunity to give back to him. Because I don't know about you, but when I read Isaiah 53, and I see what he was, you know, he was wounded for our transgression, he was bruised for our iniquity, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. I read that. I think, man, you know, as the song says, must I empty-handed go? Think of it. 
Luke 12, you, you need not turn to it. I would like for you to just really listen to this. Just kind of, just kind of listen. Luke 12, verse 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother, that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said unto them, he's talking to the whole group now, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth, the things which he's earned. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will bestow, will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Listen, verse 21, Luke 12. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. I remember reading one time, not too long ago, that in the 1940s, the average house had a thousand square feet and a single car garage. The average house now is over 2,000 square feet, minimum two-car garage. And on top of that, there are people all over the place that are renting these, you know, self, what do you call them? Self-storage. Yeah, the self-storage things. And they've got stuff crammed in there. We got so much stuff, we don't know what to do with it. I mean, it's, it's amazing. When I go bike riding into, in, into that, uh, the, uh, the uh, gated community up there just north of PFE, I mean, these, these places have four and five car garages. You know, and four to five thousand square feet. I wouldn't know what to do with that. You know what I like to do? I like to go someplace and see something that I can't afford because I start to laugh. I, there was a friend of mine. I'd go. We, we'd go to an RV show, and I'd come out. My face is hurting because who in the world pays a million bucks for an RV? <laughs> my wife and I went up to look at some homes up just north of the PFE Road. And you know, you can go through the, you can go through the models. <laughs> you know, showers with five shower heads. You know, and, and, every, and this was when it was hot. All the models are set to 68 degrees. And the yards are absolutely beautiful. I'm not kidding. 3,800 square feet, 4,500 square feet. My face was hurting. Boy, I tell you, there are some people that are doing a really good job laying up here on earth. You know, I, I, I don't want to forget to lay up in heaven. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. Amen. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Oh, I tell you, sometimes those old songs, those are just great, just to remind us. Amen. People might not like, you know, how you sound. That's okay. That's all right. Just to remind yourself in that singing. Lastly, what it means for your purpose. What it means for your purpose. We looked at what it means for your future, for your present. Hey, listen. What it means for your purpose. Hey, you know what? Heaven is worth waiting for. We've got time here to do what Christ told us to do. And again, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, one of the most famous verses in the Bible, Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And oh, by the way, the things that you need, all these things shall be added unto you. The power of God, your needs, hey, they are absolutely there. Now, I don't put stock on everything that C.S. Lewis said, but here he did say something I thought that was really good in his book, Mere Christianity. Listen. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most 
for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this world. Now, did you get that? We're not thinking about heaven. We're not thinking about the future. We're not thinking about souls that can go from chapter 20 to chapter 21. We're not thinking of that. And because of that, we have lost our effectiveness. Suddenly, even being a basic Christian becomes a burden. Why go to church and fellowship with unbelievers and provoke unto love and good works and be a blessing when I can do something else and get blessed, so to speak? Why do that? We have spent enough time on the spiritual warfare to recognize this. That Satan is going to subtly come along and keep prodding us on that. Don't worry about it. No problem. I know that there are some people here, your heart breaks like mine does. When we deal with people and they're right on the cusp, it almost seems like they're, they're going to come, they're, they're recognizing the Spirit has, has drawn their hearts, and then they fade back. And they're never seen again. And I'm telling you, just like you, there are times that puts tears in my eyes. Because that transition from chapter 20 to chapter 21 is the singular place we ought to be thinking about. When I preach, my heart is there. Because that's the time that counts. There is no more time after that to make the decision. I have something written in my Bible that I wrote when I was a football coach. The game of life is played but once. No timeouts, no instant replays. And when the clock runs out, there is no changing the score. That's it. In Spain, where Christopher Columbus died in 1506, there's a monument commemorating the discoverer and his discoveries. Someone who saw it said perhaps the most interesting feature of the memorial is the statue of a lion lion destroying one of the Latin words that has been part of Spain's motto for centuries. Their motto was this, ne plus ultra, no more beyond. They thought, that's it, beyond us, there is no more. The lion is striking out the first word so that it reads, more beyond. In closing, D.L. Moody, one of the great preachers of the last 200 years, when he would be preaching to people on this, and trying to get people to see their need for Christ and for Christians to see the need to spread the gospel, he would give this analogy, he would tell this story. There's an old legend of a swan and a crane. A beautiful swan alighted by the banks of the water in which a crane was wading about seeking snails. For a few moments, the crane viewed the swan in stupid wonder and then inquired, Where did you come from? Well, the swan said, I came from heaven. And the crane said, heaven? What is heaven? And the swan said, heaven? You've never heard of heaven before? And that bird went on to describe to that crane what heaven was like, how beautiful it was, the streets of gold, the gates and walls of precious stone, the river of life, purest crystal, on and on and on, and everything that was there for the healing of the nations, and there was no more sin, there was no more sickness. He talked all about what heaven was like. The crane looked at the swan and said, are there snails? And the swan said, well, of course there are no snails. And so the crane said, well, if there's no snails... I don't want to go there. 
And Moody used that to say, how is it that there are young people that have grown up in Christian homes? There are people that have come into Bible preaching churches. There are people that have had family and friends that have shared the gospel, but in the end, they don't want what they have been offered because they want snails. By the way, are there snails in your life that are tempting you still? You see, there are people that down in their gut, they're holding on to the snail. They don't want to listen to anything else. We have an opportunity to give people that which is far beyond anything that we can think. Let's think of it, though, regularly. When the young people gather on Friday night at full throttle, when the adult Sunday school class comes together, when the children come together, when you're out there and you've got a gospel track and there's somebody, like people that we spoke to this last week, that needs the transition, whether they know it or not, that can take them from 2015 to chapter 21, verse 1. The new heaven and the new earth. That's why we preach on heaven. That's why we remember it. And praise God, one of these days, you and I are going to gather there. And we're going to rejoice in what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. Amen, Larry? Amen. Amen. I mean, that's it. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know, I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my happy home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Heaven's getting better all the time. It's getting sweeter all the time. Amen? I know you've been sitting there and you've been thinking this. I wish he'd shut up because there's pie waiting over for me. I ain't even going to think about the soup. I'm going to cut straight to the pie. If you're going to cut straight to the pie, that's fine. Praise God. No problem. But I do know this. We'll go ahead and pray for it now. So you can just go ahead and get in line. Heavenly Father, thank you. One of these days I'm going to see my dad. I'm going to see my sister. There are loved ones here. We're going to see Mr. Rainbow. We're going to see Mrs. Smith. We're going to see Mr. Ard. They're waiting for us there. And so many more. There's folks here. They have sisters, parents, other relatives, friends, people that they led to Christ are waiting for them there. Lord, I pray that meanwhile we would look and we would see people. We have the opportunity to give them that which they need to take them from the curse of the end of Romans or Revelation 20 and transition them into looking to a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the food and the fellowship now. Lord, thank you for these dear folks that thought it important enough to come together and to be an encouragement to this preacher, an encouragement and a blessing to each other. I pray that our fellowship would be sweet. So Lord, go with us now as we go next door. Again, we thank you for the food. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.